What is your story? My story is that I and my Savior are happy and blessed. Amen. Glory to God. He is my Savior, my Redeemer. Amen. He is the watchman of my life. Amen. My provider. He is the source of all things for me. That is my story, and I'm sticking to it. Amen. That is my story. And that is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Now you gotta get your story. Yes. I got mine. Get your story. And stick to it. Don't let nobody change your mind. Okay, so we're back on the road again today. We have visited the church of Ephesus and found out that it lost its love. Then we went to Smyrna, found out they were persecuted. We didn't like that too much, so no. we wanted to get away from that. Then we went down to Pergamos and found out that they were compromising. So today we're going to move on up to Thyatira. It's down the road a little piece. But we were heading north all of this time. Now we're heading southeast, going in a different direction to the church of Thyatira. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, beginning at verse 18, it says, And unto the angel of the church in Hyathira write, These things, says the Son of God, did you come in clean? The Son of God, he says, who has eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know your works and charity and service and faith and your patience and your works. Now I want to reiterate works. He says here, I know your works. And then he gives a summary of their charities, of their services, their faith, their patience. And then he goes back to works again. So works is something to listen for in the day's message. Amen. And the last to be more than the first. So they're doing more work now than they were doing before. Work. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you because... You suffereth, or you allow that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, mm. to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then them that commit adultery with her into great tribulations, except they repent of their deeds, works. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the rein and heart, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none of a burden. No more works. But that which ye have already held fast until I come. That you have already hold fast until I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessel of a potter shall they be broken to shrivel, 
even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. He describes himself in this passage as the Son of God. The Son of God. And then he says, he has eyes like unto flaming fire. Fire being judgment. Fire being judgment. And his feet are brass, or like fine brass. Brass being the power or the authority to use that judgment. And he goes on to say, The works, the works, works is the theme of Thyatira, the works, and we're going to deal with that as we go. The only word that we need to deal with in that passage, though, is charity, because we know what charity is, but not the way they know it. Charity is the only word interpreted in the Bible love Amen. and you can find that out if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 they call it the love chapter but they never say love they say it's charity yep. so charity is the word that we need to deal with because it means love in the Greek language and charity in today's speak means something that's altogether different for that, but it denotes love because you have an affection for something you want to give to it because you like something you want to sponsor it or support it. So charity, again, in our language, it, it denotes love, but in the Greek language, it was the term. And love, in today's speak, could mean anything. Because we just throw it out there. I mean, we, go, we love it. Love you. Love you guys. I love you. And we just we just use it. So it could it could mean anything. We don't have a, a, a definite definition or a definite meaning for the love that we proclaim. But we don't want to get too deep in the woods of, of this thing, love. But I feel that we do need to to clear it up a little bit because you, it's going to play an important role in where we go from here. So we need to kind of straighten it out a little bit. So charity in the Greek language is the general use for love. They had three more definitions. Charity in the Greek language was just a generic use for love. But they had three more definitions such as eros. Eros was the, the um, passion or physical or the sexual kind of love. Yeah. And then they had phileo, which was fond of or affectionate, friendship. And then they had agape, which is the God kind of love and the only love that God adheres to, yeah. the only love that God speaks yeah. of. When he says love, he is talking about the agape kind of love. And the agape kind of love is based on a deliberate choice yes. of the one who loves despite the worthiness of the one who is loved. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to love them back. They just love you because they have chose to love you. I choose to love you. Not because of what you do or not because of the way you treat me. I choose to love you. And you're not expecting anything in return. That is the God kind of love. So, that kind of love goes against nature. It goes against nature because it is selfless. Yeah. It is selfless. It, it, it puts you in the background. And it's giving. And it expects nothing in return. You see, I love you because I love you. Even if you're trying to kill me, I have decided to love you. And when you come to kill me, I stand there and I look you in the eye and I say, 
don't do that. Please don't kill me. Don't kill me. Why would you want to do that? And the general consensus would be, oh, Bill, he was really a wimp. You see, he just stood there and begged for his life. Please don't kill me. Don't kill me. It's not good for you to kill me. Stop it right now. But you see, it is not me that I'm concerned with. I'm concerned with the person who is about to kill me because I have decided to love him. And when I beg him not to kill me, I'm begging him not to put himself in that position to have to go to prison. You don't need to go to prison and spend the rest of your life in prison. That's not what you are designed to be. God wants you somewhere else. And you don't want them to live with the guilt of taking another life. And you don't want them to die and go to hell because they refuse to repent for killing you. So you see, what we see sometimes is not what's actually taking place. Because we can look at Jesus on the cross and we can see him saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Stephen saying, Father, lay not this sin to their account. And they're killing over these men in their hearts and in their minds. But they are crying out for them because they have chosen love. So these people, these people that we're talking about here today, these people are charitable. They're charitable, he says. They're servants. They are faithful and have patience. And they are doing more work now than they did at first. And that to the eye is a good report. It's a good report, but, he says, but I have a few things against you. What can you have against somebody who is charitable, who is service, servants, who are faithful, and who have patience? Those are all good qualities to have as we see them. And so we say, what can you have against them? They've got this female leader in the church with the character of Jezebel of the Old Testament. And you guys know who that is in the movie of Second Kings, Jezebel, killing all of God's priests and putting the priests of the devil in their place. She's a swapping priest, killing the Israelite priests and putting the priests of Baal in their place. That was Jezebel of the Old Testament. And that's what is called Jezebel. She calls herself a prophetess and is teaching false doctrine, idolatry, and immorality in the church. So he calls her Jezebel. This is the perception and this is the deception that we see. We see charitable people. We see people who are serving, people who are faithful, people who have patience, and they're doing all of this work that we call good, but they're doing it for the wrong reason. You see, work is good. Work is good, but it is what's in the heart that causes the work to account for anything. See, and we find this in our present state of mind you read this and you could say to yourself, this was written just yesterday. <laughs> because we see this sort of thing going on right now in our system. Vote for me and I'll give you more Medicare. I'll give you a raise in your Social Security. I'll give you everything you need, but I want to kill every baby I can find over here and I'm going to rob the rich. But vote for me and I'm going to take care of you. So we forget about the killing of the babies and the robbery of the wealthy and decide, well, he's going to give me more of everything, so I'm going to vote for him. Selling your soul for copper is the, what the scripture would say. You see, because we want that charity. We want that gift. We want that free stuff. We want people to serve us. We want them to be faithful to get our checks out every third because if it don't come, we're going down to social services and say, hey, where's my check? 
You're faithful in that, getting our check out. And you're promising me more of everything. So I'm going to stick with you, but I'm going to forget all of the immorality, all of the idolatry, and all of the false doctrine that you are presenting to me. You see, this is what the church of Thyatira was doing. So you see, this is not a new practice. This was done way back then, and you can always find the source of everything that we see today. We can find it in our Bible. Amen. Ecclesiastes 3 says that there's nothing new under the sun. Everything we see has already been done. Amen. So you see, here, here we are <laughs> living in a time of high fire where there's people who are charitable. They want to give us stuff. But they don't want to give it to us because it's not free. A gift, the gift of God is free. Amen. The gift of God is free. Don't cost you anything. You see, and we sometimes confuse people when we say that you don't have to do nothing. Just trust in the Lord. If you believe in God, that is all it takes. There is no work to be done. Just trust in the Lord. So you see, here's, here's where we come in. That this stuff was forbidden, and it's still forbidden, to people who trust in God. This woman, it says, was given the opportunity to turn from her ways, mm -hmm. but would not. She was given an opportunity to turn from her ways, but would not. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, the Lord is not slack. The Lord is not lazy concerning his promise. As some men count slack or laziness, but is long-suffering to us what? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and be saved. God does not want anybody, does not want any one of us to go to hell. It says that he is long-suffering. He is willing to wait a long time for us to change our, our ways or to come back to our senses and stop doing what we're doing and cut out the foolishness. Amen. He's long-suffering. He doesn't want anybody. So he gave her an opportunity to change. And some of us are just like this woman. We refuse to change because what we're doing is so comparable to her, so pleasing to us, and we are having our own way. But he gives us the opportunity to change. And because she won't stop doing what she's doing, she will reap God's judgment. She is on a bed of suffering, and her followers will suffer greatly. This is not God's doing. That's another misconception that sometimes we have, that God is causing the suffering, or God is punishing, or God is putting this on us. God is a God of love. And if you love somebody with that agape love that we talked about, mm -hmm. we have decided to love, then you don't ever do anything to hurt anybody that you love. You don't punish them by putting sickness on them or, or, or causing them pain and suffering. So it is a law of nature that takes place. God has completely or will completely abandon her to her way of life. And it's like this. She will be cast into a bed, a sick bed, because those believers who practice sin end up that way. Those who commit adultery with her, it says, these who act in concert with her or who agree with her will lose their footage or their foothold and have to retreat. So they will lose status. They will lose 
control. They will lose all that they have and cause them to suffer harm or despair. To kill her children with death, her children, meaning her disciples, those that she has raised up in that way of life, will die. Not physical death. They already separated from God, but they will fade out. They will fade away. They will be no more. God looks not at the appearance of the person, for he looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the appearance of a person, but he looks at the heart. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, he says, Be not deceived. Don't be tricked. Don't be fooled. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Whatever. So you see, Jezebel was sowing wickedness and all, so she will reap what she sowed. That is what he's talking about. She will reap what she sowed. If she sowed corn, she's going to get corn. She can't sow uh, dandelion seeds and then go out and expect to find a, a big forestry of oaks growing. <laughs> You're just going to get dandelions. Because that's what you sow. And this is what he says. She sowed evil, so evil will come upon her. Mm -hmm. That's what he, he's trying to get us to understand. And don't be discouraged by that. It works both ways. Mm -hmm. So be good. Mm -hmm. It's so good, you get good. Because the seed you sow is what's going to spring up. And that's where we want to cope, keep our focus. Being good. There was some we saw in Antiochia that who had not fallen for the okie doke, so to speak. They were holding on to the word of God because it didn't matter what they said. They understood that God's word was true. It didn't make them any difference. It didn't make no difference how they made their statement sound or their plan sound. It, they knew it wasn't real. They knew that God had the divine plan and they knew that God would overcome them. And when you know the truth, they can dress it up any way they want to, make it pretty and pink, but the truth will still remain. Amen. The truth is yes. going to wear down. Mm -hmm. He's trying to tell them that the church started out pure. And it has to end up that way. Yeah. The church started out pure, and it has to end up that way. In Ephesus, chapter 4, verses, Ephesus chapter 5, I'm sorry, verse 25. In Ephesus, chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands. Guys, pay close attention to this. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. It should be holy and without blemish. So good. The church started out here, and it has to end up that way because he's coming back for a church without spot or anything. That says is that he is not concerned with building. These things that we call church, the church. This is the church. The church is us. We are the church. We are the church. He is talking about people. And we are to be washed and cleansed with the word by the time he returns and stops sinning so that we don't have no spots or no blemishes. Amen. Perfect, just like he left it. 
and he left it in a state of purity because it started in a state of purity. In Acts chapter 5, it says that there was a certain man whose, and his wife named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife. And they sold a possession, and they kept back part of the price. His wife was also aware of it. And they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not yours? And after you sold it, was the money not in your power to do with as you wish? Why has you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied unto man, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. Lied to the church. And he dropped dead. And it was about the space of three hours after he dropped dead when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter asked her, tell me, Sapphira, whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yeah, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that you have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried your husband are at the door, and they shall carry you out also. Then fell she down, and straightway at his feet yielded up the ghost, gave up the ghost. She died also. People lied to the church and dropped dead. Peter said, you lied to the Holy Ghost. You didn't lie to men. The Holy Ghost is who you lied to. The body of Christ. Jesus' blood had to be pure to start that process. Jesus' blood had to be pure in order for the church to begin. So the church has to begin pure. It has to end up pure. And thus he says in Ephesians that he's not coming back for a church with spot or wrinkle, but one without. It has to end up like it started out. It could not start out with deception and lies. So the people drop dead at the beginning or the inception of the church for lying to the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And it says that everybody who heard that was afraid. Can you blame them? No. <laughs> I mean, you, you come to church, uh, come to the covenant, and you make a false statement, it would clean up a lot of people's acts. It would clear a lot of minds. It would make you stop and think before you start spouting off. Oh, yeah, honey, I, well, uh, 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 you know, I, <laughs> let me rephrase that. I should have done yeah. thus and so. And you're about to tell a lie. You said, that is purity. And that's the way it's going to end up. And think about that. It has to be that way when Jesus comes back. That's the church he's coming back for. The same way he left it. <clears throat> so they were not in a building when that took place. He was lying to the people. And are we not the body of Christ? Are we not the body of Christ? In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of God? You don't know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body 
and in your spirit, mm -hmm. which are God's. Mm -hmm. Which are God's. So what did he tell? He says, you be holy for I am holy. Unless you are not holy, he cannot set up a temple in your body if you're not holy. So you have to be holy because he is holy. And just hold on until he returns. That is what he's, he's advising the people at Thyatira. Hold on. Those of you who have not bought into Satan's foolishness, hold on until I come. Just hold what you got. And I will not put any more burdens on you. Just do what you do. Just do what you do. Just hold on to what you have. The church is not going anywhere. It'll be here. The church wins in the end. Amen. Yes. The church wins in the end. That's it. He gives the definition of an overcomer as one who keeps his word. In today's speak, he would be saying, one who do what I say. One who do what I say. That would be how he would put it to us today. And that's, that's very what James tries to tell us. James first said it. That, how did he say it? I was going to say what James said, and I don't know what James said. <laughs> now, James said, faith without works is dead. That's where I wanted to go with that. Faith without yeah. works is dead. And that's where we sometimes confuse one another because we say that works is bad. Just like the works that these people are doing here. They're doing all of these works, and he said they were doing more works in the end than they were in the beginning. And you think, boy, that's really great. They stepped up the pace. But faith without works is dead. And James says, well, you can have all the faith you want, but if you don't do nothing with it, you got nothing. But works won't get you nowhere alone. You've got to have faith to do the work. Amen. The works come by faith. Faith is the action word. When you have faith, then you desire to do the work. And that's the work that counts. Yes. The, the faith that comes from your heart. The work yes. that comes from your heart. Amen. You're doing this because you love yes. the person yes. that you're doing it for. Glory to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So James is, is saying faith without works is dead. That's not contradictory to what Paul and Peter says when they say you can't work your way into heaven. Works are no good. You yeah. gotta have faith. Yeah. And then James comes back and says, Faith without works is dead. So now you said, Well, before they said that we didn't have to do no work. And now you said that if we don't do no work, we don't have no faith. But he's saying that faith drives you to work. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because you have faith, you begin to want to do works. Amen. Because faith again is an action word. Yeah. You can have all the faith in the world, but if you don't put feet to it, it doesn't get you anywhere. Amen. I think I'd use that, this example until I wore it out, but I'm going to use it again. Because if you have faith in God and you trust God for everything that you have and you are hungry sitting on your couch and saying, I have faith in God and he's going to feed me no matter what. And you sit there with that faith. You will starve to death. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get up and do something about it. Yes. That's what James is saying. Yes. Faith is great. You know you're going to get it, but you have to get up and go acquire it. You can't just sit there, yeah, God's going to take care of me. God supplies all of my needs through his riches and glory. That's a true statement. But when they find your body, <laughs> you, you will have believed right into the kingdom. You have to do something. And this is what James has told us. Faith without works is dead. And then John comes along and backs him up in uh, John 14, 15, where he says, if you love me, you'll do what I say. So you don't have to sit around and try to convince him. You don't have to talk to him. You don't have to do that. Just do what he said. Amen. That, that's what he's talking Just do what he said. Put feet to your faith. Do what he says. That, that is what will get you through. 
And he said, those who overcome, that, that's what he's talking about. Those who overcome. Those who are, are obedient, he said, those who overcome, those who are obedient, who does what he says, will share in God's authority because you will have the morning star. You will eternally be in the presence of Christ himself. You will eternally be in the presence of Christ. You will have the morning star. Jesus is the morning star. Eternally in his presence. This is the church of Thyatira. A corrupt church. A corrupt church. A church that offered you favor for your soul. Another church that we don't want to linger at. The corrupt church. Of what I have given to you, I received of the Lord that on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And we need to, to expound upon that Amen. just a little bit. The worthiness of eating and drinking the Lord's body and blood. It is not a matter of your righteousness. It is not a matter of comparing yourself with God. It is a matter of cleansing the soul. It is a matter of not partaking of the purity of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ in a corrupt, defiled body that is harboring envy, jealousy, hatred, and all of the things that's contrary to the word of God. So what he is saying to us is, before, before we partake of his body and his blood, we should go within ourselves, we should examine ourselves and see if there's anything in us that shouldn't be, anything in us that would not agree with the purity of the blood of Jesus. And it goes with what John says in the first epistle of John, chapter nine, he says, that if you've committed any sins, you ought to confess those sins. And if you confess those sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive you those sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So that is what this moment of self-examination is all about, is to go within and mm -hmm. say that if there's anything in you, Father, take it out. Mm -hmm. So let's just have a moment of silence and seek out the envy, jealousy, and all of those things that are impure in our bodies and in our hearts. Now, if you have asked God to remove all of the impurities from your body, then you have complied with his desires, and that is to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Mm 
and it says he's faithful and just to do that for you. For those who don't do that, he is saying that when you partake of his body and his blood with malice, envy, jealousy, hatred, wrongdoing, and all these things in your heart and mind, that many who, who partake are weak and sickly among you, and many die. Many die. So that's how serious the blood and body of Jesus is. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If we'll go in there and find those things, admit them, ask for forgiveness for them, he'll clean them out. So he doesn't have to judge us anymore. We can be clean, pure, as we were when he died upon the cross. That is what he gave us through that death on the cross. You see, the death on the cross was not only for our sin, it was also for an opportunity for repentance of sin. That we can get out of it by saying we're sorry, in other words. That he would pardon us. So the work on the cross is for everything that is concerning you. Everything that has anything to do with us was taken care of at that one stop. So when we do this, we do this in his honor. And we are following his divine plan. And that is for us to hold on to what we have until he comes. How do we do that? It's by remaining pure. Remaining pure. And when we sin, we are quick to ask for forgiveness. And when we ask for forgiveness, he is quick to forgive so that we can maintain the level of integrity that he left for us. And when he had taken his body and broken it and given it thanks for it, he said, take, eat. This is my body that was broken for you. And do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for the blood. We know that without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sin. So as we partake of the blood, the blood, Father, we accept the life of Christ, and we thank you for giving us an opportunity to be part of you and of your body, Father, as we struggle to be this tedious thing called life. And he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do, and as often as you do it, as often, not every first Sunday or every this, that, or the other, but as often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. And in doing so, being in compliance with the word of God, we partake of his body and blood. Not as a ritual, but as a celebration of his death, burial, resurrection, and his return. And we do this in preparations, folks. When we get to the kingdom, he said that he would do it again with us. But he would not do it until we got there. So you see, we are preparing ourselves for that feast that wedding supper that Jesus is planning for us in the kingdom, in line with his word. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for all that you are. We thank you for the opportunities and the provisions that you provide for us, helping us, Father, to find our way to the kingdom. We thank you for your word, Father, as it is a roadmap to guide us and to teach us and to lead us, Father. Help us to be bold enough to walk that path. Help us to guide others toward the kingdom. Help us to be all that you intended us to be. Yes, and Lord. fill us with your presence and with your love. Yes, we thank Lord. you, Father, for the day's journey. We thank you for the nourishment that we had for our spirit. And we ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, to bless those who are ill or injured, Father, and heal them with that mighty hand of mercy. And we pray for those, Father, who are traveling and ask that no hurt, harm, or danger would befall them. We thank you again for this opportunity, this gathering, and for 
your love, your word, and your presence. In the name of Jesus.